Hello, my friends. Welcome to uh, the wet lab. The wet lab. So the wet lab is this pretty big space where you, you handle wet specimens in the collection. Like this. It's stuff that's stored in ethanol. Usually there's a lot more people here. You know, any day you can come in, you'll see someone like processing a lion right there or I don't know, putting a, unpackaging a bunch of turtles over there. But today we are all alone because it's the weekend and I don't have a life. So we have the place entirely to ourselves, which means we can do whatever we want. Within reason, of course, we have a project that I need uh, to do today. So I thought I would bring you along. Why is this so out of focus? Let's go. Come on, come with me. All right, take a look at this. Okay, we have two jars here that are both um, very different in a couple different ways. Over here we have Odontesthes regia. Odontesthes regia, a Chilean silver side. And over here we have uh, some Polydon spa spathula, which is one of these. Polydon spathula, an American paddlefish. How how cute is this little guy? Do you see his little eye right there? Ah! This right here is a nose. How insane is that? It's part of the, the rostrum. It's kind of right below their eyes and above their mouths. Okay, two entirely different species, but um, there's something a little bit more important and obvious here. You can see that this one is full of some very clean alcohol. This right here is super fresh. Mm. It's it's so fresh. These things were prepared relatively recently, so this jar is full of fresh alcohol. It looks very nice. It's very presentable. This one, however, is uh, not not so presentable. This thing's from 1990, a really long time ago. It almost looks like it's full of like blood or gunk or something like that, and it smells. <laughs> Do you know those puddles that form under dumpsters? Imagine smelling that, but also like a. Uh, add like a gallon of nail polish remover. I explained this in my salamander video, but over time, uh, fat leaches out of these specimens into the into the ethanol, the alcohol that they're preserved in, and um, it just starts looking kind of nasty. So today as part of some uh, general collection maintenance, I thought it'd be interesting to go back into the wet collections and pull a jar off the shelves and show you guys how we zhuzh it up, how we give it a little makeover from one of these guys into one of these guys. And to make it especially interesting, I thought it'd be cool to do it with a jar of Piranha. So let's go get it. Let's go into the wet collection to pick our piranha. <clears throat> Yo, welcome to the wet collection. Here we contain all things wet. This is the collection where they preserve all of the wet stuff. The big wet stuff are in these containers over here. This is where I pulled one of those giant salamanders. They were kind of kept on these shelves right there in those big giant tanks. All the small stuff is held um, on shelves in tiny little jars. I'll get one for you. Here's one right here, check this out. These are a bunch of uh, little squid in this jar right here. I always thought it was kind of crazy that it's like, okay, high-end museum, right? A ton of very important research is happening here and we store everything in like the same jars that you would like, I don't know, make jam in. Okay, this place seems very small. It's, it's more than just this, this row right here. I'll show you guys how big it is, one sec. Here's one room, it goes all the way over there it goes all the way back this way. This is room number one. Ready? And there's more. There's another room. And another room. And another room. And another room. There's a lot of space and holds a lot of stuff. But what does it hold? The wet collection holds everything you could ever want um, in terms of animals. We have a mammal collection where you can find things like a jar full of very tiny bats. Incredible. A mollusk collection where you can find more snails than you your, uh, your heart will desire. A beautiful herpetology collection, which we're not allowed to film in for legal purposes. And an extensive fish collection featuring all the fan favorites, like the electric eel. Electrifying. <coughs> I'm so freaking out of breath. Sick, let's go find some piranha. Here we are, and we're starting with the Latin name for piranha, which I wrote down because I can't remember it. It's Pygocentris nateri, and it's in the family Sarah Salmidae. Okay, so after we have the Latin name, we consult this graph right here. This is less of a graph, more of a chart of all of the families of all of the fish in the entire world. And we're looking for the family Sarah Salmidae. So let's find it. It is chicken. Where are you? Got it. So Sarah Salmidae is in group 12. Oh my gosh, I found it right here. I found it. This is way too bright. One sec. Perfect. We have two shelves. Bing bang. All of these of uh, red bellied piranha. So now comes the time for us to choose one of these jars to zhuzh up. 
Who's ready for a makeover? Choose your piranha! Welcome to the piranha shop. I'm so excited that you've decided to come and pick up a piranha for a nice little makeover. Let me pull out some from the shelves and see which one works for you. Just have fun with it, because that's what it's all about. First off, we have this Pygocentris nattery. If you look really close, um, something uh, bit its eye. Nevertheless, if you're interested in this one, it's on the shelf. Wow, this is a beautiful set right here of a whole bunch of piranha. You can see the liquid is nice and yellowy, kind of like a dehydrated urine look, which is great. Exactly what we're looking for. Here we have a jar that looks very similar, except these have some big juicers in them, some super big boys. Again, we have that characteristic dark dehydrated urine look, as if you haven't had anything to drink all day and you played soccer in the hot sun. So tell me, what do you think? What are you liking today? We can pull out anything that you like. TBH, I'm feeling the big boy juicers right here. You want to do that? Okay, let's take this. Back to the lab. So now we begin the process of replacing the fluid inside this jar. Before we get into this, we got we to gotta suit up. We got to suit up, baby. Time to suit up. Boom. Now we are protected. Ooh. So here's the deal. The reason that I wanted to pull piranhas out of this jar today is <clears throat> there's an interesting story about piranhas that I learned while researching them very recently. If you believe that piranhas are these kind of ferocious, man-eating fish, you have been hoodwinked, hoodwinked by history into believing that. <laughs> it's not necessarily that you've been lied to, you've kind of been lied to a little. And the person to blame is very interesting and it's someone you might not expect. It's a former president, Teddy Roosevelt. Here's the story. Teddy Roosevelt lost a presidential election, boo-hoo, he was sad. Then he decided to go on a safari in Brazil. He's like, I'm gonna drown my sorrows in the Amazon because that'll help me forget about that election that I just took a massive L in. So by this time, Teddy Roosevelt was previously the president of the United States, and the, the local people in Brazil really wanted to put on a show for Mr. President. President arrives in Brazil. They are like, oh, Mr. President, you gotta come over to this river where you'll see a spectacle unlike anything you have ever seen in your entire life. So they took Theodore Roosevelt into the depths of the Amazon rainforest and came upon this section of the river where in the water they found thousands and thousands of these bad boys right here. Piranha. Look at this bad boy, he's looking so good. Very characteristic piranha shape. We have an extended dorsal fin on the top. We kind of have a truncated tail with a little bit of a divot right here towards the front. It's relatively kind of narrow, very broad this way, and a kind of a bulbous head right there. Nasty looking frown, a huge underbright. Prognathism, shout out to science vocab term, prognathism. The jaw uh, really juts out forward, almost like a bulldog or something like that. We can't see the teeth, unfortunately, because a lot of these wet specimens are, are preserved with their mouths closed and they're very, very tough. Like this thing is rock solid. It's, it's not very malleable. So we can't even bend open the teeth. That doesn't mean that I don't have some teeth to show you. We're gonna take a very quick pause from the story, but remember where we are. Teddy Roosevelt has just arrived at a river full of red-bellied piranha and he's about to destroy the red-bellied piranha's reputation for the rest of time. We're gonna take a quick break from that story to check out some piranha teeth in the dry collection. The dry collections is uh, the part of the museum where they hold the dry specimens. For example, the bear skulls. I think this is a Kodiak black bear. Big boy. And my favorite uh, piece in the dry collection of all time. You guys might have seen this. <clears throat> a walrus baculum, AKA a walrus penis bone. Yeah, uh, walruses have giant bones in their wieners. Makes you kind of wonder, you know, like, one second. Interesting. Well, we're looking for the red belly piranha, so we're gonna go over to the fish. This is where they hold the fish stuff. It's all the way back there. I'm gonna pop back into a cabinet and uh, find a, a box of uh, piranha chompers. Got two good ones. All right, here's what a box looks like in the dry collection. Open it up and here's what it looks like inside. Ooh la la. <laughs> fish are usually kind of all piled together. All of the bones are kind of piled together in these boxes. Um, usually they're kind of broken apart and in pieces. This one's pretty unusual because we have a nice little head right here. Piranhas are very distinct 
because they have a single row of extremely sharp teeth on their top and lower jaw. The one in the other box isn't articulated, so I think we can get a better look at that one. Yo, here we go. This is very strange and unusual because more often than not, fish do not have their teeth in rows like we do. Usually, there's something like this. So this is a video I filmed of a fish called a gilt-headed bream. You can see how it has like a collection of teeth that all look like little pebbles, but they form a palette. They're grouped into a general area. Piranhas have that super neat teeth organization, and every single one looks like an extremely sharp canine tooth, which is wild. <clears throat> so when Teddy Roosevelt came across this river, it was full of fish, piranhas, and in each piranha's mouth was a full set of extremely sharp teeth that was exactly like that. Let's go back to the story in the wet collection. So Teddy Roosevelt stationed near this um, near this river, pulled up to this river with a bunch of people from Brazil. And um, out of the forest, they pull like on a rope, um, a cow, a, a big old cow. They huck the cow into the river. And what happened next is probably exactly what you would expect to happen. The cow got wrecked. The cow got super destroyed. Um, it was it was picked to the bone by by the piranha in in the river. Theodore Roosevelt wrote a very popular book about his adventures in Brazil. After seeing this cow just get wrecked by piranha, he he wrote about the piranha in the book and described them as like these crazy killers. The, here here are some of his quotes: The piranha or cannibal fish, the fish that eats men when it gets the chance. They mutilate swimmers. The head with its short muzzle, staring malignant eyes, and gaping cruelly armed jaws is the embodiment of evil ferocity. Teddy Roosevelt's books were read by a lot of people, so naturally a bunch of people suddenly had the opinion that this is what piranha were like. Not only that, but for whatever reason, a lot of these piranha descriptions were published in local newspapers across the country for like years after. People think that this is the event that perpetuated this idea that piranha are kind of bloodthirsty animals that can kill people. <laughs> but there, there's some issues with what he saw. Um, Teddy Roosevelt's experience wasn't necessarily an accurate representation of reality. Oh, that's super dank. Ethanol. Here's issue number one. A fish expert from I think the Baltimore Aquarium who knew a lot about piranhas and I don't know, their biology, did the math and they said in order to kind of devour an entire cow you would need to have about 400 to 500 piranhas and give them about, I don't know, like like five minutes or so to destroy that cow. I mean, the problem there is that uh, like it's not natural for 400 to 500 piranhas to school together in a specific area. That's a lot more piranhas than would ever naturally occur in one place at one time. So the other issue that a lot of biologists have with this story is that um, <clears throat> this is like not normal piranha behavior. The truth is very surprising. Piranha are omnivorous. Piranha eat more things than just meat. And a lot of piranha don't eat meat at all. Their diet is primarily like seeds and plants. There have been studies done examining a lot of the piranha attacks where people have died from being attacked by piranhas. They theorize that a lot of the deaths have been caused by, by drowning. And then when the dead body was floating around, then the piranhas kind of start to nibble and chomp at it. <clears throat> piranha might nip you every now and then, but they're not like the huge, savage, bl savage bloodthirsty killers that, that good old Teddy made them out to be. So how do we explain what Teddy saw? The theory posited by some experts is this. People in Brazil knew that Teddy Roosevelt was coming. They wanted to put on a nice little show for the former president. So they took a section of the river and uh, kind of like blocked it off with nets on both sides so that nothing could escape. Then they caught a ton of piranhas from the surrounding area and dumped them into that section of the river. So it had like an unnaturally high concentration of piranha. Then they starved the piranha for like weeks beforehand to make sure they didn't have enough food to eat. These piranha were like insanely hungry so that when they put the cow in, the piranha would just kind of like, oh shoot, the piranha would just tear it to shreds. So they think the piranha ate the cow, but piranhas don't usually eat cows. Piranhas might nip you if you swim in a river with them, especially if they're very hungry or it's kind of like the dry season and there's not a lot of food, but they're not the bloodthirsty carnivorous fish that they were painted out to be by Teddy Roosevelt. I didn't know this and I just thought it was an interesting example of how our current opinions about some animal or something in general are influenced by just one person's experience from a very long time ago. Also, here's the jar. How do you think it looks? Does it look all right? I think it looks a lot better.